Good afternoon. This is March 22, 1999, here in Natick, Natick, Massachusetts. This is the part of the Morris Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And what is your name today, sir? My name is Tom Carr. Tom Carr. Can you tell me, are you married? I'm a widower. A widower. And do you mind if I ask you your age? 78. 78. Do you have any children, grandchildren? I have uh, had six children and ten grandchildren. Ten grandchildren. <laughs> you have a busy life, Tom. <laughs> Where were you born, Tom? I was born down in Watertown Square. In Watertown Square? Yep. And you were raised where? Uh, I was raised in uh, Watertown, Newton, Waltham, Brighton, and finally moved to Natick right after I got out of high school. Um, why, do you, why did you uh, move to Natick? Well, Your my father bought a house here? in Natick, and yeah. I was 17 years old, and you're kind of still on the family then. Yeah. About what year was that? Uh, 1939. 39, and you were 17 years old. So that's about the time the war broke out in Europe? Very shortly. Yeah. yeah. What was your family uh, background? Why, why did you... Uh, grow up a couple of towns away and then moved to Natick? Well, my father was uh, a first-generation American, and the Irish were always trying to improve themselves, and he wanted to get out of the city and get out into the country. And Natick was country then. There were 10,000 people in Natick. Yeah, it's, it's One changed. third of what there is now. Yeah. And what, what did your dad do? He worked for the Boston Consolidated Gas Company mm -hmm. in construction. Mm -hmm. And your mother? My mother was a housewife. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, this is 1939. Uh, when and where did you enter the military? Uh, well, it was August of 42 before uh, I signed up for the military. Mm -hmm. And I signed up in Boston, signed up with the uh, Army Signal Corps. What was Natick like at the time in 1942? Well, it was 10,000 people, and uh, it was a little country town. And uh, downtown was downtown. Route 9 was out in the woods. Uh, there was nothing on Route 9. That was just the expressway to Worcester. Mm -hmm. one, one traffic light, I think, between Boston and Worcester on Route 9. Why did you enter the military in 1942? Well, Everybody had to at the time. We had a draft, and yeah. you either volunteered or they drafted you. It wasn't much of a choice. But uh, people didn't mind. They, they knew it had to be done. What uh, branch of the service did you go into? Tom? I went in the Signal Corps. United States Army. Yeah. Why did you choose that branch? Well, uh, in 1942, early in 1942, right after the war started, um, most branches were out advertising to attract people, and the Signal Corps seemed to uh, lend itself to what I thought I had for talent at the time. I was mechanical, and I liked electricity, and the communications uh, was a good field to be into. So something in your professional background or well, uh, not your not much. You know, in my yeah. I was only, uh, you know, 19, 20 years old, so it was more of my aspirations of, of what I thought I could do. Did family or friends join the military when you did, when you went into Boston? Not with me. You were alone? I was alone, I, yeah. I, okay. Uh, when you came back and talked to the other guys, uh, did they, they go with you uh, later on? Did you go into the service by yourself? Yeah, I went in by myself. All by myself. Oh. Where did you go to basic training? Uh, Seagirt, New Jersey, Camp Edison, which was a part of Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. And um, you had a month of turning you from a civilian into a soldier, and then you moved up to the main fort where you got your technical training and further military training. So at Seagirt you learned to march and things like yeah. that? Yeah. And then you went up to uh, Fort Monmouth, was it? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you do uh, develop any close uh, friendships during basic training? 
fellows that you were with? Well, uh, it's uh, military, it, particularly the Signal Corps. Uh, you develop real good friendships while you're there, but once you get orders or somebody gets orders, because you're going to be scattered all over the country, uh, friends and debts are both forgotten. You go on to the next mm -hmm. element. What sort of things did you learn in basic training? Well, I took a uh, teletype repair course. I took several telephone courses, installation and repair of switchboards, telephones, uh, teletypes, and uh, even code equipment. You mentioned a minute ago when we were talking that you were uh you were kind of a private phone company. Is that's that, what uh, we were. That's what you were learning to that's do? What, that's what we were learning to do. Okay. So that's, that was your specialty during the whole time you yeah. were in the service? Yeah. Uh, what did you like or dislike about the kind of work you were doing? Well, the work was fine, except uh, overseas, we were out in the jungle. We were 8,000 miles from uh, our patch depot, so you had you know, you couldn't just call down the corner store and get parts for things. You had to practically make things uh, or make do yeah. or salvage yeah. or uh, jury rig. But uh, you had to keep sophisticated equipment going under, uh, you know, in a, in a rainforest. Uh, and mm -hmm. teletypes were not built to be operated in a tent in a monsoon rain, and yet we had to keep them running. We'll get back to that in a minute because that <laughs> sounds interesting, it really does, but where did you go after New Jersey? Where was your first post? Overseas. <laughs> you went uh, immediately overseas? Well, no, they, they gave me a week. Uh, I got my orders on a Saturday to leave Camp uh, uh, Fort Monmouth. I was headed for Camp Crowder which is in Missouri. Uh, so I left on a Saturday, got there on a Monday. And as I got there, uh, I was reporting to the first sergeant. And the captain walked out of his office. He says, we're on the 48-hour alert. So on Wednesday, we left Missouri. And Saturday, I'm back in New York, 40 miles from where I started. And the next stop was a boat headed overseas. Where did you go? We landed October the 12th, which is Columbus Day, in Bombay. That's what Columbus was looking for, if you recall. And uh, then from Bombay, we went across India by train, and then uh, up the river, up the Brahmaputra River by boat. And then we got onto a narrow gauge rain, uh, train and we went up into northern Assam, which is the north east corner of uh, India. Were you by yourself, Tom? Or you? I was were, with a company then. I joined you, a company. You joined in, a group of folks. Who, did, were they on the ship with you and then on the trains? Yeah, we, when I joined the company in Missouri, yeah. they were just forming a country uh, company, you know, bringing in the specialties from all over to form a company, a okay. signal service company, and then they shipped us as a company. Can you tell us the name of your unit at that time? Well, actually, we, we didn't know what unit we were. We were a casual company mm -hmm. until we get to North uh, Assam. And then they told us we were Company C of the 835th Signal Service Battalion. That's what we became. How many of you were there? The 260 in a full company. Is that the group you traveled with? Yeah. Okay. But see, I didn't meet any of them except maybe two until two days before we left Missouri. Yeah. Did your duties change at any time throughout your career, or were you basically doing? I basically was a signalman all the time. All the time I was. You there. must have gotten pretty good at it after a while. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> in in uh, when you were up in India now, were you in combat or you were, were you no. were a service unit? We were a service unit. Yeah. In uh, fact, that whole theater, uh, China, Burma, India, which is larger than the United States by far, uh, there were 
only two American combat units. One was Merrill's Marais. Mm -hmm. They were known as the 5307th Provincial Group, and they were only a regiment size. And later on, um, there was the Mars Task Force, which was only a regiment size, and that's all the American uh, combat troops that were there. We had British uh, combat troops, Chinese combat troops, Indian combat troops, and we were working with them. So you were making it possible for them to move along? As, as yeah, we were all one army. Yeah. Okay, can you tell us what the dates were uh, in the places you were? What, what you, you go, went over in October? I went over in October. Then we started up the uh, Lido Road, which was a tremendous engineering feat. It was the road that the British said couldn't be built, and most people agreed with them. They sent uh, General Lewis A. Pick up there and said, build a road over three or 400 miles of unexplored jungle during the monsoon season, and uh, he built it. <laughs> you, you said a moment ago you were talking about uh, working in monsoons and in tents with some pretty sophisticated equipment. Did the military pre prepare you for what you were getting into? No. <laughs> so you guys had to uh, ad lib it as you went along? Yeah, yeah. Can you give us an example of that? Uh, well, let's say in Natick the rainfall is an average of 65 inches a year. I think that's about the precipitation in this area, which is five feet of uh, water. Uh, the monsoon comes within a period of about four months, which is one third of a year. And you get something over 400 inches of rain, which is something over 30 feet. And it all comes down within a four month period. And uh, you're in a uh, rainforest. You're always wet. The, uh, your shoes will mold right off your feet. Your tent gets moldy, everything gets moldy, and your equipment gets moldy. Now, if you took a piece of electronic equipment and tried putting it out in a tent in this kind of weather and try to operate it, uh, it becomes uh, almost impossible at times, but yet you've still got to operate it. Can you give us some examples of what you did to uh, survive in this, in this situation? <laughs> Or, or keep your equipment going? Well, keep the equipment going. We had constant maintenance on it. Uh, for example, you can't get uh, uh, carbon tetrachloride, which is uh, a cleaning fluid. They don't use it anymore, but it was big then. We used gasoline because it would evaporate. <laughs> we took plain gasoline out of our vehicles and used that to wash our equipment in to keep it uh, oiled. And uh, uh, keeping the dust out of it was another thing. Keeping mold out of it, we used to uh, put electric light bulbs in the middle of stuff just to get some heat in there to, to keep drying our switchboards. We'd always put lights in there because we had no heating elements or anything or no access to it. If an airplane crashed, for example, we would salvage all the parts we could from it. Uh, light sockets, light bulbs, wire, uh, to build uh, something to dry out our equipment. Were you, were you, was your unit on the move all the time, or you, were you in one particular place? No, no. We, uh, what would happen is they would build the road and the pipeline, which they were trying to build a road from North Burma uh, over to connect to the old Burma Road, mm -hmm. and uh, it was about 500 miles. And uh, in the meantime, everything was being flown over the hump from uh, Assam into uh, China. And we were trying to build the road, but there were a couple of Chinese, uh, Japanese divisions that had, you know, other thoughts about the whole thing. So it was slow going, and sometimes it moved faster than others. And the whole thing moved together. But you would, uh, a station would open up. You'd send maybe five signalmen up to open up a, the communications to put in a switchboard and whatever, a radio. But then as 
things move forward, that station would build up till you might have 50 men in that one post. By that time, you were rear echelon. And you're off again to another five-man station. We kind of leapfrogged all the way up uh, two or yeah. three hundred miles. You must have uh, made some close friends in the service. Uh, were, were, you make you, close friends, but you don't have them long because of this they, they constant move you movement. Too, is that it? I might see you uh, this month, and I might not see you again until September. <laughs> and you know, hey, we're old buddies, <laughs> and we'll be there for two or three weeks, and then you're gone or I'm gone. Yeah, can you think of uh, who might have been your closest friends in the well, I service? I think uh, probably uh, George Jackson, uh, who was from uh, a little backwoods uh, town in Tennessee. He and I uh, left Fort Monmouth together, and we were still in the same company by the time the end war ended. Are you still in touch with no, him? No, no. Lost track of him a long time ago. How did you hear when you were over in this place, which uh, is pretty remote, how did you hear about what was going on in the rest of the war? I was a signalman. You know, <laughs> we had radios, and we listened to BBC and to uh, Tokyo Rose. Did you get any official communications from the Army itself? Yeah, the Army, uh, well, they, they tried, let's put it that way. But every day, they sent out a bulletin which went through the Signal Corps by teletype, usually, to all the remote areas, which was just a synopsis of all the news all over the world and the baseball scores and things like that. Yeah. And it, uh, our, our message centers handed, handled most of them. And so we'd make off three or four copies on our teletype machine and distribute them around. Would you say then that uh, you were probably uh, better informed about what was going on than most of the troops in the field? Oh yeah, very much so because uh, many uh, people used to come into our uh, radio shack at night to listen to BBC because when we went on the air we had BBC on. So you were getting the news right from we were the getting the road. We were getting the news right from, right from London. <laughs> Where did you go from there? Home. <laughs> Home. You have a little booklet there on the table. I wonder yeah. if you show that. Well, to uh, us. I think that a lot of veterans should be interested in this particular book. This is the India Burma uh, campaign, and uh, it's published by the Superintendent of Documents in Washington, D.C. There were over 90 campaigns during World War II all over the world, uh, varying lengths, some of them. and. Uh, what we did, uh, well, what the Superintendent of doc Documents did is publish one for each uh, campaign. And I think that if you uh, contact the Superintendent of Documents in Washington, D.C., you can get a uh, catalog of what ones anybody would be interested in. Mm -hmm. And these are, are pretty good uh, if uh, our photographer, there are things in there like battle maps uh, that you, you know, for each of the battles that mm -hmm. uh, were fought and where things were. And uh, then there, there's also uh, some pretty good uh, topographical, here's a, another, now this, this is a typical picture of uh, along the uh, Burma Road, you know, winding through the, mm. the jungles and up the mountains and down, switchbacks were normal. And it was a dirt road, and uh, it was mud muddy most of the time. So driving on it was not uh, I-90. All right, thank you for showing this. That, uh, but people can order it from the superintendent okay. of documents. I'm glad you told us that. Having been there and having read that book, do you feel it's a pretty accurate portrayal of what you went through? Uh, it has a pretty good overview. Okay. Detail it lacks. <laughs> Uh, you can't sweat, uh, you know, uh, you can't envision the amount of rain, or the amount of disease. You see, most of the casualties, uh, more than half ca of the casualties of this, these, this type of campaign, and it was true in the uh, uh, South Pacific too, was, was disease, not, not bullets. Uh, at one time, uh, companies in our area were averaging 35 percent of their company was at all times down with malaria. 
Now that's a pretty high percentage, and a lot of them didn't recover because malaria, they found out there's more than one type of malaria. There's some that's recurring, some that uh, uh, attacks your brain. Uh, the, there's some very serious uh, malarias. What did you, did you get? Uh, were, were you afflicted with this? Uh, I would say yes, but officially no, because with most of us, we had malaria three or four times, but we never had any treatment for it because we didn't have medical facilities. You know, they'd be 50 or 60 miles behind you. So you'd take some Adabrine, or, or you took Adabrine all the time, but then if you felt you were coming down with malaria, which was like coming down with a cold, you'd switch to quinine and dose yourself on that for three or four days, and you'd, you'd get better. Yeah. What kind of medical facilities did you have there? Most of, well, we had field, t uh, field hospitals, but they're pretty well scattered out. You're not near one when something happens. Uh, up closer, you get a, a tent, which is an evacuation tent, staffed by a medic. And he's got uh, a bottle of uh, aspirin and another bottle with uh, that purple stuff that they paint on you for, like, mercurochrome, but it stings like heckmer. Uh, <laughs> when you get methylate, ringworm or something. Is that a methylate or something like Something like that. Yeah. I don't know what the name of it is, but uh, uh, I had uh, ringworm at one time, and what you do was every day you'd get down into a creek and scrub it wide open and run up to the medic tent, and he'd paint the uh, ringworm and let you go for another day, and after a while it might dry up. How long were you in this area? Uh, pretty close to two years. In all that time, can you think of what might have been your most memorable experience there? <laughs> Not hardly. It was, it was just a struggle to stay alive and sane. And boredom was your uh, your biggest enemy, because you'd go for you know long periods with nothing but jungle to look at. I'm going to use a funny word here, but what did you do for recreation to escape the boredom? <laughs> uh, well, sometimes we went hunting or fishing uh, in order to eat properly, because, you know, uh, you'd get uh, deer or uh, wild boar or uh, fish. Well, we used to get something like a catfish. I don't know what it was, but it was about this long weighed about 40 pounds, and uh, some uh, dynamite, you know, into the water, and uh, <laughs> you might raise one. And the natives would uh, take off everything else that came up. Or we'd, uh, uh, we'd build things. We'd build, you know, showers out of uh, bamboo. Bamboo is probably the greatest uh, material, most versatile material in the world, and it grows quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a grass, and uh, you can eat it, you can wear it, you can live in it. <laughs> uh, you can do anything with bamboo. You mentioned Merrill's Marauders a little while ago. Yeah. Did you ever come in touch with, in contact with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Oh, they, they, <laughs> they were probably the most beat up, uh, misused, uh, regiment size organization in the whole war. There were 3,000 men to begin with. And I remember driving a truck up the road and some of the marauders would be walking along and you'd stop to give them a ride and they wouldn't take a ride because they were supposed to be in training. They had orders. They couldn't take a ride. And by the time they got to where they were going, they were so beat up <laughs> that they couldn't move any further. I mean, they beat the crap out of these people. Uh, and uh, they had volunteered to, for one mission. Well, that one mission led to another mission, to another mission, and uh, the human being should not take the punishment that those guys took. Physically, I'm not talking even about the shooting, which they went through too, uh, but the terrain that they covered. Yes. And uh, their transportation uh, were mules. We had 16,000 Missouri mules, and the Marauders had most of them. <laughs> and uh, the Marauders really took an awful beating, and it was a 
an awful shame. Politics played a lot to do with it mm -hmm. because uh, the politics of the CBI uh, from the high command on, nobody knew what was going on. And they were, they were really uh, at each other's throats at the highest levels. Who was the high command so far as you were concerned? <laughs> well, Lord Louis Mountbatten, mm -hmm. a British uh, was supposedly the theater commander. Uh, General uh, Stilwell, Vinica Joe Stilwell, was the American commander. And he commanded also General uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army, uh, Chinese army. But So he was in command of the Chinese army, the American army, but then still uh, Montgomery was in command of him, and then they didn't get along all that well. Kaishek had Stillwell fired, and then they sent over General Wiedemeyer to pacify him. And in the meantime, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt were uh, trying to push the whole thing aside because one was uh, Churchill was concentrating on Europe. Roosevelt was concentrating on the South Pacific, MacArthur's command, and Eisenhower's command. And we were off by ourselves trying to keep the Chinese in the war. Because basically our job was to keep a million uh, or so Japanese troops uh, engaged because if they overran China, then they would send them down to the South Pacific. And this the South Pacific guys had all they can handle as it was. Yeah. They didn't need another million Japanese down there. Is this about the end of 1944 you're talking about yeah. now? Well, just as a, as a sidelight to that, out of the jungles one time walked a, uh, a little uh, native, and he went to the Americans, and he says, uh, I will help you clear out the Malaysian Peninsula of Japanese, if you will help me. Well, it sounded like a good deal. But this little uh, native wanted to clear all foreigners out of his country. But we said, we can't do that. Who was this person, do you know? Yeah, Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to kick the French out, and, and the French were collaborating with the Japanese at the time. And he wanted all the foreigners out of his country. Where did you hear about this? We knew about it then. But we didn't know what it was going to develop into. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, Ho Chi Minh at that time, we felt, was a patriot. At this point in uh, your military time and experiences, uh, D-Day had come and gone. and the Well, D-Day was late. That was in 1944. Yeah. but. When that came along, did you folks feel you were in, in an isolated place then? We knew we were. We were 19, 20-year-old kids, and every one of us looked like we were at least 40. You could tell a rookie when he came in. He looked his age. We looked twice as old. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you're up there a year and a half or so without a day off. You know, there's, there's no rest leave, no Saturdays, no Sundays. I mean, every day is just tomorrow. Were there never any uh, replacements? Uh, <laughs> we got replacements because our company went from 200 and some odd men up to over 700. But all of those people coming in, a lot of them had stripes and what have you, mm -hmm. but we still had a table of organization for 260 men, so nobody's going to get promoted. Out of all of this, can you think of a uh, most memorable character that you ran into? Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of them. But Tell us about one. Well, we had this fellow from, I think we, his name was Charlie Taylor, and uh, he was a lineman a good one, and you told him to go put in a line, and he would go put in a line. Don't ask, don't tell him how or why or what he was going to do, but this guy would take nothing from anybody. 
I mean, he, uh, so he had a line truck. You've seen them around town. I mean, they still have them, you know, trucks with the Derrick on the back or a post yeah. hole digger. Yeah. To, the telephone company has them. And, and he had one of them. And all of a sudden, the inspector general sent a team up to, which do what inspector generals do. They take inventories. So he came up and he inventoried this truck. And uh, he found that it was missing a set of come-alongs, which is a, a pulley for pulling wire together. And, uh, you know, it's worth probably $15, $20. And he was going to uh, make Charlie Taylor pay for this because it was missing out of that truck. But what he didn't know was that Charlie had stolen the truck to begin with. <laughs> We weren't authorized the truck. We used to go out and steal them. <laughs> so uh, he was quite a character. I guess so. <laughs> Where were you discharged? Uh, Camp Edwards in uh, down the Cape. Let's let's go back just a second. How did you get home from where you were? Uh, well, it's a good question. It's a lengthy one too, by the way. It was in August of 45, right after the war uh, ended, after the Japanese surrendered, that uh, my father had died in, on the 30th of May, and my uncle had contacted the Army uh, and started processing to get me home. I didn't know anything about this, but he started it because I was the eldest of the family. All the other kids were in school. And um, so in August, I got orders to come home. Uh, so they sent me by plane, by train, by boat, by jeep. I finally get down to Calcutta to a replacement depot down there. And then I waited until middle of September uh, and they processed us to come home, and it was summertime. They took all of our woolen clothes away and everything, and got us all cut down to uh, suntans. And then finally in uh, October, uh, they got us on a boat. <laughs> and uh, we left Calcutta, and when you leave Calcutta, it's three days down the Hooghly River till you get to the ocean. And when the tide comes in, you move. When the tide goes out, you lay in the mud till the next tide comes in. And it takes three days to get to the ocean. So then it took us 28 days on the boat. And we got back to New York on in November. Still in suntans. Still in suntans. And right. we came down that down the gangplank into a warehouse in New York and then suntans. And we're freezing. I mean, here, we'd been two years in the jungle. And here we are in November in New York on the, on the seashore. And your blood's kind of thin. <laughs> yeah, blood is pretty thin. So yeah. they took us over to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. And the colonel over there got one look at us, and we're all turning blue, I guess. So they march us down to the warehouse and give us these big, long overcoats to put on over our suntan. We were a great-looking army, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I got discharged, at, uh, I think, the first week in uh, November. So you started in New Jersey and you wound up in New Jersey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got then you came home to Natick? Then I came home to Natick. Okay. What was Natick like when you got home? Different? Same? About the same, yeah. But About everybody was glad to see us home and everybody was getting home. and. Uh, let's face it, uh, we weren't fit to live with when we got home. We were animals. We just, our uh, language, our character, we had been living, scratching the earth for so, with nothing for so long that we were animals. And the uh, kids from combat, they had uh, the same things that the kids from Vietnam had. We just weren't fit to live with. We had, how, how, how were you received by the, the Our own families home? received us very well. I mean, they were, 
they if it wasn't for them we would we'd go completely bananas so walking around in in uh, whatever was left of your uniforms i did did people say anything to you about your service in the military no uh, we used to wear what they call the ruptured, ruptured duck, duck, duck. Yeah. <laughs> and that and a dime would get you a beer. Yeah. You had to have the dime, you didn't have to have the ruptured duck. How important to you was serving in the military? I don't know about the importance, but it is a defining moment in anybody's life, I believe, because you went through so much shock, so much trauma, uh, that it changed you forever. Tell us about changing your life. Well, you, you've got to, to uh, put value on things. You know, uh, what you think is important as a teenager, you know, uh, going to the movies or getting a new suit of clothes or uh, having a nice, uh, going out to dinner. Well, you dad soon learned in the army that these things weren't important at all. <laughs> and it, your, your values changed. When you're laying in the mud someplace 8,000 miles from home and you're saying to yourself, what the hell am I doing here? Or how did I get here? Your values will change. Over and the when you see people yeah. starving to death, have you ever seen anybody starve to death? Yes. Well, you know what it is. I mean, it's a, tra it's a trauma. You never get over it. Once you've seen it, you never get over it. And in 1943, when we got to India, they had a, a famine of 1943, and on the railroad platforms, I remember one railroad platform where 75 people a day were starving to death. You walk up and down the uh, platform, stepping over bodies. Hey, you know, you get to know what's important. You, somebody crying because they haven't got, <laughs> you know, jelly to put on their bread. What did you think then, and what did you think now uh, regarding your military experience? Uh, I think the experience uh, was more having seen other, other cultures rather than military. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you see how other people live. You, you get to respect their values, and you get to respect them, and you get to see the, that there are other points of view, there are other ways of doing things. So uh, I think that uh, the experience is more contact with other people than it is with just the military. Mm -hmm. The military is mostly trauma. <coughs> Tom, you've had uh, quite a few years to think about your coming home in, in that uh, finally getting home from quite a difficult experience. Can you tell us how you feel about how you were received coming home and uh, fellows that you might know or have read about that came home from Korea or Vietnam? Uh, well, I had a son come home from Vietnam. And uh, actually, from the day he got home, it took him 10 years to get home. Uh, he was, his experience were traumatic, more, than my, more so than mine were. And it affected him, and I, but I knew it, and uh, I got drunk with him to begin with. <laughs> I mean, it's, this is always a good starting point, but it actually took him 10 years to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. He was 50 years old when he finally got his degree from college. You know, he, he was uh, a freshman in college right out of high school when he went to the, into the Marines. And he was 50 years old when he got his degree in uh, college. And, this is how it affects people. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the trauma that they get through. Uh, it's the psychological experiences. It's, it's all inside. It's uh, not what somebody says or something does. It's how, how it affects you. Yes. The more it affects you, and you never really get over it. Personally, for you, is. Uh is there one thought or memory that you would like specifically to tell your family about in terms of this tape? They're looking at it later on. Uh, nothing, not one thing. I think it's a, it's a long, but I think that uh, military experience is traumatic. Uh, well, you take the first time you go into, first day in the military, the night you cry yourself to sleep, what, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, there's nobody to make your bed, nobody to uh, pick up your clothes, uh, 
you know, these are the first things you learn in the military. You know, how to make a bed and bounce a quarter off it. Uh, uh, how to pick up your clothes after yourself. Nobody's going to do it for you. Uh, how to wash your dishes. <laughs> uh, but these, these, these are terrible things for youngsters sometimes. I mean, you take them right out of high school and uh, no mummy, no daddy, uh, particularly mummy. <laughs> it's drama. We're getting close to the end now here. I'm going to ask you a question about um, a long way from now, historians are going to be looking at this tape. Have you any particular message you would like to give people 15 years down the track about what you went through, what the community went through, what the United States went through? Well, I think that from a historian point, and I've been reading a lot of it lately, uh, I mean, Citizen Soldier is a wonderful book mm -hmm. uh, on uh, Europe, and uh, I've read a couple of other books that are good, but one thing I've noticed about historians, they try and take, like, World War II, like I said, there were 93 different campaigns, each one of them separate and all going on at the same time. And yet they will take peripheral issues that were issues, but per they were only peripheral, and they will seem to emphasize them. For example, in World War II, when you start talking about it, they talk about uh, uh, the Holocaust. Everybody knows the Holocaust existed, but it was a peripheral issue to the war. It wasn't the main issue. Mm -hmm. And the same with uh, 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 racism and segregation and what have you. That was an issue, but it wasn't a major, it wasn't the issue. It was part of the overall picture. And they, they blow these uh, civil rights things and humanitarian things uh, completely out of context and make those the focal point. When they weren't the focal point, they were side issues. And I think that uh, anybody looking at this should, uh, my war was a side issue. <laughs> I was one of 94 campaigns. And the whole thing, you know, there was uh, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, was the Air Corps then. Uh, <laughs> but they all had their jobs to do. There were 12 million men and in the service, and each one of them had a very important job to do, and some of them were boring as heck, <coughs> and, but they all contributed to the overall picture. And you should not focus in on side issues, but you shouldn't overlook them either. Any one last thought you'd like to add to this tape? No, I hope to see every veteran in Natick, and I'd like to see uh, the Natick Library uh, be a leader in the world is to, during this re video recording. Uh, in uh, Tom Brokaw's book, uh, he said everybody should be running around with a tape recorder. Well, we're doing even better than that, running around with a video recorder. And uh, I'd like to thank Ellen and uh, John and Jimmy and Joan for their efforts in this. Well, we'd like to thank you too and very much. We appreciate your being there and your part of history, and we, we're grateful to you. Thank you very much, John.